Well, sometimes I do something which might come across to some people as fairly wacky when warming up for these videos. I watch a video myself. Not of me. I'm not that narcissistic. But a movie or something. Something which I feel is appropriate for my reading subjects to get me want of a better word, in the mood. Today I watched The Big Short. I've been teaching, but it was looking over exam papers and the students doing exams, so while I was just sitting here waiting for them, and responding, I had The Big Short on. Why is that appropriate with the Bruma class? Why is it appropriate with this wonderful class of little ships? When I say little, I mean little in relative terms. They are nearly 6,000 tons fully loaded. Um, well, 5,856. So what's 144 tons between friends? And yet... I watched the big short. Is it because their turbines they have are turbines which the Russians had ordered from the Germans rather than the Brits? You can understand why, let's be honest, the Brits and the Russians keep not getting along. Or from the Americans, who have a far more mature and capable turbine industry than the, uh, than the Germans do at this point. And we know it's not as good as the British one. Uh, but and I have no history of going to war with either of them, uh, with, with them. Um, they order it from the Germans. And those turbines, instead of being delivered, of course, to Russia, because war begins, are instead put into these light cruisers to, divide, uh, to power them. No, it's not, the, it's, not the, it's not the turbines. It's not the turbines. As... Absolutely moronic as that decision is by the Russians. And I'm sorry, it is. If anyone wants to disagree with me, they can. They can point out all the logical things which were for it and all the decision making and all the power plays they want. But in the nicest way, there are two countries which Russia has habitually ended up fighting wars against at various points in that period, and they were actually in a grand alliance against at this point, and one of them, against one of those, and that's Germany. Now, I can understand not going to Britain, and I can understand some people going, well, you know, there's the traditional alliance and we're between the royal families, you know, their connections, but that doesn't really matter. Nicholas, the Wilhelm, and all these things, it's just stupid. When you have another option, they not only, this is the thing, they not only order light cruisers, they order the freaking turbines for their battle cruisers from Germany. But that is not the reason I was watching the big short. No. Actually, it's Germany, because post World War One, there is a treaty system fairly reasonably quickly, in you know, in historical terms, established, and that puts a limit on what ships you can build. And even prior to World War One, there is a cost limitation because you know ships are expensive, well, especially capital ships. So that puts expense on what you're buying. But here is the problem. The Brummer class, and I know, for those of you who are wondering about this particular photo, it's only got one Brummer class in it. It's got the Emden and the Frankfurt in there as well. Yeah, and the Brummer class in it is actually the Brems. And 
What's the reason for watching The Big Short? Why is it so appropriate for this? The best and most powerful submarines that the German Navy managed to deploy in terms of their number of kills and their risk factor and their effectiveness were their mine-laying submarines. Their most powerful and most effective surface raiding vessels in terms of actual ability to be deployed and capability were their mine laying light cruisers. And it was worked out before World War I began, a long way before World War Gap began, that this would be the case. But we like to believe that occasionally the British have cornered the market on hubris. Sometimes it's considered to be the Russians, the Americans, the Chinese. We all like to believe it. But one power usually managed to escape that. For some reason, Germany. And they really shouldn't. Because if you wanted to cause the British maximum trouble, mine laying cruisers that would rapidly deploy to off the coast of the UK, drop mines by the hundred and disappear would have been freaking evil to deal with. They could have carried more mines than anything, really. The most common class of mine layer that saw service in the German Navy, submarine wise, were the UC2s. They could carry a maximum of 18 mines. The Bruma class could carry 400. The UC2 had a range of between 7,000 and 10,000 nautical miles at seven knots on the surface. That's barely good. The Bruma had a range of five and a half well five thousand eight hundred nautical miles at 12 knots but also had a top speed of 28 knots so they could dash in and dash out the fastest the uc2 could go was 12 knots and if it went that fast on the surface it would get into trouble otherwise they had similar things in that they both had uh 50 centimeter torpedo tubes and they both carried 88 millimeter guns although in the case of the Bruma class they carried four single 5.9 inch or 150 millimeter guns as well and they're two single 88s and two torpedo tubes The thing is, to lay the same density and accuracy of minefield as a Brummer class would require 21, possibly even as many as 22 of the UC2s, and they only built 64. The Bruma class were far better than the Nautilus class. They were far more capable than their predecessors. They were larger, they were faster, they carried more mines. They required a few more personnel, but a little bit of, had a little bit of armor. And yet they aren't built till 1915. The Nautilus class are built between 1905 and 1908. They are built at a slow rate, 
and they are used as a proof of concept. They prove the concept despite the fact that they are slow. So despite the fact they are not really what the Germans would like for doing in the North Sea. They are fine for the Baltic, but they are not really what they want for the North Sea. And yet, the German Navy, which can more than happily afford a few more of these vessels, can more happily afford to build some of these light cruisers because they don't require much in the way of armor. There really isn't much on the ship. They don't require much in the way of large guns. In fact, they can churn out those guns incredibly cheaply. They can churn out mines incredibly cheaply. Crew size isn't massive. The engine requirements for these is not colossal. They could have, but they didn't. They knew they needed them, but they didn't. Why? There are times I'd like to blame it down on just on Tirpitz because it's easier when you can blame a single person. And I hope no one thinks I'm being angry. I'm being sarcastic at this point. It is easier when you can blame it on a single person. And I do worry that this is in, mm, to an extent, getting into the rant sphere, but no. Some more dismay at perceptions. The reason the Germans don't do it, the reason the Germans don't order a mass of mine laying submarines prior to World War II, the reason they, uh, well, prior to World War II, or even prior to World War I. It's because there is something in Germany which actually doesn't seem to like mine warfare. It makes so much sense for them to deal with Britain. Because you don't need numbers with a minefield. You need one mine layer, maybe two. You send both of them out there to cover each other, and you lay a minefield of 800 mines. And then they come back. And what is, the diff uh, what is the possible remedy for the RN to deal with minefields and mine layers? Well, they'd have to have ships out at sea. They'd have to have a constant combat sea patrol of cruisers, of three or four cruisers to guarantee victory, sitting in the North Sea waiting. And they wouldn't just have to have one, they'd have to have two or three. And they'd have to have minesweepers. They'd have to have all these things in place. This is a very easy way of maximizing the problem for the Royal Navy at minimal effort for the Germans. Maximal threat, minimal effort. And yet, no. You often get the caricature of British admirals saying submarine warfare is underhand and it's just un British or all things. The Royal Navy is one of the largest submarine arms in the world consistently for the first 50, 60 years of the 20th century. Even to this day, it's arguable, despite its shrunken size, it's one of the most capable. In other words, there are British animals who are prepared to decry it, but they don't actually undermine it. It still gets there and it's still capable. Germany is the proponent of underseen warfare. They are the standard bearer. They are the image when it comes to undersea warfare. You don't think about the Japanese submarines and all the feats they got up to. You don't think about the Royal Navy submarines. You don't even really think, unless you're American, about the American submarines or the Italian submarines. No one really thinks about what the successes they achieved. Everyone thinks about the German submarines. And yet, arguably, the Germans were the most closed-minded when it came to submarine warfare of any nation. Because they actually had the proof of concept. They had the capability. They had the idea. They employed it in the First World War eventually. And they employed, uh, employed these ships eventually. 
First they tried to not use them as mine layers. First they tried to use them for other things. Then they used them for mine laying operations. And then they used them for surface raiding operations. They were excellent in all of them. They tried all of that. And yet, still, still, every time it's begrudging, every time they have to be pushed to do it, every time those very same voices who are shouting the loudest for submarines, for unrestricted submarine warfare, for the capability of submarines, for them being the new age, new coming power in, some, in naval warfare, they have to be dragged, kicking and screaming, to the mine. Mines are like artillery in land warfare. Everyone knows the biggest killer, if you're fighting a war on land, is artillery. Everyone knows that it will account for the most of your casualties if it's being fired upon you, and everyone knows it is the most powerful weapon at any commander's disposal. It's the long-range artillery. The thing that allows you to reach out and smack down on something at a distance when they think they're safe. And yet, every time you try and get funding for artillery versus tanks or a new rifle or an APC, everyone looks at you funny. Go back through the history of modern artillery procurement. Look at the times funding has been restricted. Even with modern warships, Naval gunfire support. How often is that being looked at? Even by nations who don't routinely, routinely fit cruise missiles to their surface ships. Naval gunfire support is almost a dirty word. You know how effective it is. Same with mines. They knew how effective they were. They knew what speeds they needed. These ships could do 28 knots, i.e. they could go at battle cruiser speeds. It's not something they couldn't have been building between 1908 and 1915. And I'm not suggesting they should have been churning them out by the thousand, but it would not be beyond the capability or wits of the Royal Navy or the German Navy, to have procured a couple of such ships each year. So, what we have is we have ships which could have been built earlier. We have capabilities which could have been built earlier. And I mentioned the Royal Navy then as well as the German Navy because it always strikes me that the Royal Navy could have been building these ships as well. The Royal Navy needs them just as much as the German Navy. In fact, Every navy arguably needs fast mine layers. The difference is, prior to World War II, the RN has learned its lesson and is building them. And they build the Abdiel class, and they build some of vessels, and they build their own, uh, their own mine laying submarines. Not in vast numbers. You don't need them in vast numbers, but you need enough. And they're useful. During World War I, the Royal Navy depends mostly on conversions for providing its mine laying force. The German Navy, they build them in theory. Bremer is something rather special in that, despite the fact that she sunk at Scarpa Flow she, uh, after World War I, and, you know, when the, they scuttled them themselves, she's actually still down there and hasn't been recovered. So if you fancy going and doing some diving in Scapa Flow, you can, and you can find her. She is one of the six, seven-ish German ships, I think, down there, and there's three British ships, warships down there. Um, she's about 36 meters 
is usually is the average point, but that's just between roughly 30 and 40 meters um, down. And it's fun to go and dive around if you have got the right scuba equipment and have got the right guides. If you haven't done it before, I cannot over over overemphasize you want someone showing you the ropes in Scarpa Flow. There are some very interesting areas which will look safe but are not. Anyway, she was originally ordered under the name C, and of course from A.G. Vulcan, uh, who had been building. So, be careful if you go down diving, okay? She was built, as said, under a contract name C from A.G. Vulcan, who are the people who have been building the turbines. A lot of Russians. And it took a while because they needed to design her. And then they worked out what guns they were going to put on, put on them and what their operation. All things which could have been done pre-war, which could have been done by building an iterative process of from the Nautilus class onwards. But no, things have been allowed to rest for a good eight years almost. And of course, they were being built by someone completely different from the builders of the, of the Nautilus class, who had been built by A.G. Wazza and Bremen. Anyway. The Brummer is fairly successful. She comes into service, has very little problems entering service. She seems to be pretty much with the fleet from May 1916, although doesn't take part in the Battle of Jutland, doesn't sail for the Battle of Jutland. Would have been interesting to have her there, but honestly, she isn't going to change much of the results. And it was in autumn 1917 that Richard, the Admiral of, in charge of the Admiral Staff at that point, decided to supplement the U-boat campaign with surface raiders attacking the convoys to Scandinavia, and I'll be talking about one of those later. The idea was that these vessels were perfect for that because their range, their capabilities, and because also, as they were mine layers, if they would go out and the British heard they were out, the British would expect them to be laying minefields, not attacking convoys. So they would respond as if they were hunting down mine layers, not surface raiders. They also, at some point, considered using Brummer and Bremps uh, for operations from the Azores, where they had planned to use a similar tanker-style setup as they would use for the Deutschland class when they were on their operations in World War II. Could have been quite capable. They didn't go with that because they realised there's one small problem with that idea. Getting them out there. Also the fact that they have two coal and... Four oil, uh, four oil fired water tube boilers, and whilst they could resupply the oil at sea, they were worried about the coal for uh, supporting the coal. And that's also another reason why they have the three funnels. So the Bremps. What's always good with the Bremps to point out is you can see the different the layout of the guns. You can see the fact that she has two single single mounts aft, one single forward, and one single between the two forward funnels. All the main guns are mounted centerline. The 88mm, uh, you can see quite clearly, are mounted aft of the uh, last funnel. And they are for AA defence, but also for being able to use against smaller ships. So, she's a very capable vessel. As soon as she is completed, Br uh, Brummer and Brems go together to start laying minefields off Nornay. Uh, they also were used to escort mine sweepers. So these two mine laying vessels would be used to go and lay mines. They'd also be used to escort mine sweepers, which were sweeping mines. They were good at those jobs. They're basically their mine warfare vessels. Now, she actually does quite a few mine laying operations. They do quite a lot of mine laying operations. But it's always considered almost a secondary role by the German High Command, in that they're always looking for other things to have them do, rather than mine laying. But most of the mines and the minefields they lay are quite successful at causing the British a lot of trouble. They don't always think anything, 
but they always cause a lot of trouble. Now, I've been hinting about an action in which they were involved on the 17th of October 1917. And by the way, the best write up for this is on the War and Security blog sort of page. Uh, it, it's a cool one about the Scandinavian, the Scandinavian convoy action on the 17th of October 1917. Uh, in this, the very, very nice Martin Gibson writes it up. And very capable Martin Gibson writes it up. And it discusses the fact that this vessel, the Mary Rose, along with HMS Strongbow, were not really up to the task of defending their convoy against the two light cruisers. It was morning of the 6th of October, they were headed out with the various convoys. They were supposed to carry a westbound one, uh, they were, had an eastbound one. And Mary Rose, detached from the eastbound one, went to the westbound one, found that, was escorting that back uh, to cross over with the eastbound one. This was a very interesting operation. Now, there is a small problem here. This happens, and it's often one of the examples used to discredit Jellicoe and replace him with Weymouth. Which was what the First Lord of the Admiralty wanted at the time, the politician in charge. He was in charge of However, the fact is, the operation and escort was under the command of BT. He was supposed to be in charge. And he detailed off eight of his destroyers to do the escorting. He didn't want to detail too many because he needed destroyers to escort the Grand Fleet if they had to go and fight another Jutland. The reason for all this is because there really isn't enough destroyers available. There really aren't enough large ships going around. And really what the Royal Navy needed was some more light cruisers. But they didn't have them. If they had had some more light cruisers and had some with the convoy, would that have changed things? Who knows? Um, six inch guns versus 5.9 inch guns. If you have a couple of cruisers, it turns into an even fight. Three cruisers, it probably turns into something approaching a route. One cruiser, well, they get damaged, but they possibly still, will probably still win. One cruiser and two destroyers. Mm, these things all get interesting. Anyway, what they have is two small destroyers. Neither of those commanders were warned that the Royal Navy actually were hunting a German force that was believed to be at sea. It was believed to be a cruiser and a couple of destroyers for a mine laying operation. And in actual fact, they had... Glorious and Courageous were two of the larger cruisers hunting at sea. They had other vessels as well. They had 27 light cruisers, 53 destroyers, were all hunting in various groups, hunting around for these ships. Again, we can imagine what would have happened if, I don't know, if the British had been operating at a distant, a heavy, a distant escort, or a heavy escort, and a close escort, as they did in World War II. But they were still learning the convoy escorting rules and World War I, and to be honest, they hadn't thought this was going to happen. Which is stupid. They should have realised it was going to happen, but they didn't. Now, neither of the commanders were aware that the Germans were at sea. But what happens is simple. They were being rigged to resemble British C-class cruisers, which they do look sort of like. Um, I could get another picture up of a HMS Caroline, but they do look similar to HMS Caroline and the C-Class cruisers. When HMS Strongbow spotted them at 6am on the 17th of October, she made three challenges. None of which were answered satisfactorily, but they were answered, but they just weren't answered satisfactorily. And her commander then prepared to open the fire but the Germans returned fire, fired first, and that severed Strongbow's steam pipe and left her unable to manoeuvre. It also wounded her commander, and he actually refused to allow anyone to abandon the ship until the books and, uh, books and, uh, of books and papers had been destroyed, because he thought the Germans would try and take Strongbow. He then scuttles her. 
And so by 7.30, her commander is carried off this ship and put onto a Carly Ruff. She does pretty much no fighting because of this. Mary Rose, this little ship, headed for the sound of the guns. Remember? One little destroyer. Fox, the commander of Mary Rose, had assumed that the convoy was being attacked by a U-boat. It's nice to sort of put it as he was attacking against heavy odds. But at uh, roughly 6... Um, she starts opening fire between 6 and 7,000 7, 7, yards. And she was trying to draw the cruisers, the Brummer and the Brents, away from the convoy. So that the convoy could scatter and get away from them. However... By 7 a.m., she had to be abandoned because after 40 minutes of fighting, there wasn't much of her left. Her commander was last seen swimming and didn't survive. And then only three steamers and two trawlers managed to escape the oncoming onslaught. This is what happens when surface ships, surface raiders, get into convoys. This is what's often forgotten when we start talking about history. Nine merchant vessels, all neutral, were sunk. Another reason the British had thought it was safe was it was all full of neutral shipping. Two British, one Belgian, and two trawlers survived. Two British and one Belgian merchant ship survived. Only four officers and 41 men of Strongbow's crew survived. And only eight out of 80 on Mary Rose survived. Both ships had roughly 80 personnel. The commander of HMS Strongbow, Brooke, well, he died due to consequences of pneumonia as a result of the action. There are roughly 150 Scandinavian Neutral person, uh, neutral merchant crewman survived. Died, I mean. Sorry. Mary Rose had tried to send out a signal, but she got one message out, but it was not really in, uh, not picked up by many, anything, and she didn't get any more because they were jammed by it from Brummer and Brents. And Strongbow had been attacked so quickly she hadn't got any messages off, despite the fact she'd had time to send free um, challenges. So she should probably have sent off a message at that point. So by the time the Admiralty realised what had happened and ordered cruisers to intercept the Germans, they were on their way home. Court martials. Well... They are. They were a very interesting affair. The court martials both try and justify because their colleagues are both dead to an extent, and also work out what they should have done. The argument is often that Brooke would have been better off to have tried to draw the Germans away from the convoy, and that Fox should have stayed out of range and called for help. Brooke was the commander of HMS Stronger, uh, Strongbow. But they did what they did, did what they could. And this was one of the biggest losses of life of and loss of merchant ships in World War One in one go. And it wasn't even with their minds. There are actually reports which come from after the war, which, you know, various people ascribe to. And I'm... the trouble is with all the records and things that happens in the Weimar Republic and various other things, some of the reports and information is a bit scattered, especially when it's converted to English. I do wonder about some of its phraseology. And my reading German is, be is good enough. I would like to read the actual reports. But what the impression I get is that a fair number of officers in the cruisers thought they should have had their minds with them as well. 
and maybe not lay a minefield, but would have put something in the path of the convoys, so that even once they recovered from the convoy which had been sunk, the next convoy would also run into trouble. That's what mine lane cruisers do. They cause trouble. They were, of course, built by AG Vulcan of Stettin, who are a very good constructor for the, uh, the German Navy. Uh, they, and for Germany, they built the Kaiser Wilhelm de Gross, uh, they built the Rhineland, they built all sorts of things. This was a principal yard, a very capable yard. They built so, so many ships. And if you go and look, they sort of, they built torpedo boats, they built submarines, they built destroyers, including lots of ones for the Greek Navy. Lots of various cruisers for the Chinese. Always nice to know the Chinese are getting good ships. They built a cruiser for the Russians, the Bogota. But what you have to really think about with these vessels is they are, in many ways, the German Navy's premier cruiser building yard. Yes, they build battleships, including the Pomeran and the Rhineland, but they are so associated with building cruisers. It's like certain yards in the UK in the construction of destroyers. If you're talking about destroyer, you're going, and it's a really good destroyer, you're going, it'll come from one of three yards. Nine times one hundred, you're right. It's the same with AG Vulcan and their German cruisers. So just some of them. It's uh, there's the. Hamburg, the Hansa, the Hertha, the Breslau, the Wiesbaden, the Brummer, of course, and Brents, and the... all these ships get built up. They are experts when it comes to constructing these ships. AG Vulcan are really, really The problem is, they're defunct as of 1945, and they are based in Poland, so Stettin, Poland. So during World War II, they are pretty much a submarine yard, but they're using slave workers and their own prison camp and etc. Which means that, frankly, I wouldn't really want to be in a submarine constructed by them in World War II. But in World War I, they produce very good ships. So the summary. The summary. It's difficult to say sometimes, when we're summing up these ships, what they really mean. The Brummer class are a glimpse into what was possible. They're also a glimpse into what you build when you're under the thumb and you have... They're also a glimpse into what you build when you're under pressure. They're putting them together as quickly as they can. They're building these ships. But if this is what they built when they're under pressure, imagine what they could have managed if they had been building more. And yes, I realise I'm a broken record when it comes to ship construction and wanting to build more. But I'm not always like that. I would like more large destroyers in World War II to have been built before World War II, but... And I say this sincerely, but... There is definitely an argument that you couldn't build more tribal class for the Royal Navy, whilst building them for the RAN and the RCN makes sense. Because the Royal Navy was at that time 
keeping those groups elite, but also was focusing on cruiser production and trying to build cruiser numbers up. So only once they get mid-war and they realize they cannot ever get the cruiser numbers up as high as they need, that they start going, we need actually the larger, for, uh, larger destroyers as well. And by that point, you want a new design of larger destroyer. You want something which takes into account the needs and experience of the war. There is something called proportionality in construction. And it's most uh, visible when we're talking about fire stations. When you build a fire station and you're designing it, very rarely do you design a fire station which has one bay. You might be only going to put one truck there, one tanker unit, a normal unit, not anything fancy with a super long ladder or anything like that, just one tank, uh, tank unit. But you usually put in two bays because let's say your population density expands, more population. Then you have space for a second vehicle to be put at a base there. You also have space for training. You have space for accommodation. You ha it's sensible because it's far cheaper to build something with two bays than it is to later have to rebuild it with two when you need to or build a new site. This is especially true when we look at older construction. More modern construction, let's be honest, they tend to try and get away with spending the bare minimum. They knew what they needed, they knew the capabilities they needed. The Nautilus class were good, they were happy with them, but they knew they weren't enough for the North Sea, they knew they weren't capable for the other areas of operation they wanted to do, and they knew they really wanted something faster. So they knew all that, and yet they wait till they're actually in a war. When someone approaches them and goes, we have these turbines which you've just seized and no, got no plans for. That's when they go, oh, you know what? Some more of these would be really useful. And that's not preparation. That's not preparedness. That's not anything which they should be. Yes, there is an argument that if you are spending all this money and there isn't a war, then you've wasted money. But the Germans were never going to outbuild the British when it came to battleships, when it came to dreadnoughts. No, never. I never even planned to. Risk fleet theory is always based on being a certain percentage of the British. Of being large enough that if the Royal Navy fought them, they would lose enough ships that everyone else would magically decide to fight the Royal Navy and destroy them. So therefore, they would be too much a risk for the Royal Navy to actually fight, so they have to give in to the Germans. Nice idea. Doesn't work in practice. It seems so perfect, but no, there's one small problem. The A, the Royal Navy will build their own ships, and B, if the Royal Navy is ever at a point at which it's going to accept that, it's basically lost already. already. So it can't afford to accept that. Not with Germany. They're too close. So. If you're going to do that, and if you're also worried about being Copenhagen, then rapidly being able to deploy mines prior to a conflict in order to cover your approaches and provide you with defensive depth makes sense. But also, the fact is, mines favour the defensive naval power. They are an offset strategy. They are a capability which allows a smaller power to cause a larger power a lot of trouble because the Royal, uh, for the Royal Navy to counter Threadnoughts, 
and has to build its own dreadnoughts. Preferably more than the Germans are building. But it's not a massive amount more industrially and professionally for British capacity to, to deal with. <laughs> to deal with mine laying cruisers requires a lot more effort. You know, let, let's consider that. They heard there were two mine laying cruisers out. Well, one and a couple of destroyers. And they deploy three large cruisers. Including HMS Glorious and HMS Courageous, 27 light cruisers, and 53 destroyers. Eighty-three ships necessary to go, and they still failed. Because they didn't have radar, they didn't have air search capacity that we have now, they didn't have any of the tools they needed for it. Think about that. You want to tie down the British, uh, the British. You want to make it very expensive for them to do business. You build mine layers. Honestly, if I was the Chinese right now, I'd be doing the same thing to uh, to cause the Americans to have uh, trouble. You might deploy mines off converted or discrete trawlers, etc., uh, instead of at, at the actual proper warships. But actually having a warship which is a mine layer and is a far ship in service, doesn't matter how you're really going to deploy the mines, it's going to cause problems and make your opponent have to start thinking out how they're going to counter it and how they're going to deal with it. This is the reality of mine warfare. It is the insurgency of the sea, and it is requires a similar sort of approach as counterinsurgency does. The Germans have this. They have this capability. They have the idea, they have the knowledge, they have the finance, they have the shipyards, they have everything in place, and they don't do it. And the Russo-Japanese War and all those other conflicts that had gone on not that long before this had all shown the capabilities of mine warfare. When they were called torpedoes at one point in the American Civil War, they were effective. This is the reality of what we're dealing with and what the problems are. And the reality of why the Brummer class don't get enough attention. Because I'm not saying they'd have been war winning for the Germans, more mine laying cruisers. And I'm not saying this is with hindsight, because they had the information before the war began. But they would have caused the British a lot more trouble and a lot more problems if they had kept building vessels after the Nautilus class. Even if they'd just been building one class of two every three years. So 1908 to 1911, they built another two. 1912 to 1914, they built another two. So they had four in service. And then build whatever the Bruma class 1915 ships are. They could have done that, not much cost, not much expense. They could have had a lot of capability and could have caused a lot of worry. They didn't. So, what we've got coming up? Well, I have filled in the missing. Dates. So we have the 29th of March, we have ARA La Argentina, the modified Arafusa class, which is wonderful. We have the SMS Admiral Spawn and the Navarra Nova class is in the 31st of May, they're World War One ships. 
Then we have the Krona class of the Swedish Navy, because, well, I think you will like some Swedish cruisers along with your Swedish meatballs. And in November, we have the Admiral Hipper class of the Kriegsmarine, because, well, we won't have had any German ships for a while, and I thought that they follow up quite nicely on the Svoboda class. Anyway. I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you enjoy what's going on. Uh, I hope you enjoy Lord Charles Bereford's uh, birthday on Thursday. And take care.